Dr. Suzuki, welcome to Win Today. What a joy to meet you. So great to meet you too, Christopher. I am so happy to be here. I can't wait to see what this conversation or where this conversation takes us. Yeah, me too. And I'm just really thrilled for today's conversation. And let's just start here. In fact, before okay. I hit record, you were saying, okay. hey, let's let's think about long-term. Let's think about long-term solutions yeah. and not simply behavior modification or self-help. So let's just start here then. If anxiety is a built-in alarm by nature, mm -hmm. why are so many people crippled by it today? Yeah, so that can be explained or the way that I think about it is, Yes, the core emotion of anxiety is a normal human emotion. Everybody has it. It evolved over millions of years to protect us. That is one of the core kind of ideas to understand about anxiety. But why, why do I feel like I'd like to kick it out the door and never see it again? Simply because in the world that we live in today, there are so many triggers for our anxiety that are coming at us 24 seven. It's not like our ancestors where the trigger was the, the raging animal that comes at us. That doesn't come, out of, come at us every hour of every day. It comes at us occasionally. We can deal with it and then we can calm back down and come back down to normal. But when it's one after the other, first this one email, then the text comes in and then, and then the uh, email on top of it to say, hey, I just wanted to put this at the top of your email <laughs> chain to, to give you even more anxiety. Um, and you know so many so many different forms from immediate uh, fears and worries for yourself, for your kids, for your family, to the existential worries of um, climate change, wars, it, violence in our in our society today. It is never ending, and what it's doing is is that it is triggering this normal um, emotion. Um, way more than I think evolution ever realized it would be triggered. And so it's a realization that that's happening. And to understand the science of why it's being triggered and also the science of how we can normally and powerfully um, decrease that triggering. How can I not be triggered so much? How can I, how can I modify what I read um, and also how I approach all this information so that it, it becomes information rather than triggers for, for that anxiety that so many of us are feeling every day. Let's stay on triggers just for a moment. And I think yeah. about how people start their days and we can get into the tactical end of this uh, later in the conversation. But I think yeah. about the fact that so many of us are conditioned to pick up our phones right away. Mm. Um, to get the blue light exposure, you know, our, our, our brains are just waking up and we're filling our minds and our hearts with the traumas yeah. of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're just complicating the matter before we even get going. Do you want to speak yeah. to that? Is there anything we can yes. do to reverse the course in that way? And then we'll, we'll, we'll go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, uh, one of my favorite studies to talk about for my undergraduate students is the studies done in these monks from Tibet, um, where their EEG patterns were just so different from, from non, non monks. <laughs> and you think, well, you know, they, they are different. They, they get to sit alone on a mountaintop and meditate all the time. But there's something um, that that is part of the secret for why that meditation is so powerful. And one does not need to isolate on a mountain for, you know, all of their life to get that. And I, I think one of the most powerful ways to start one's day uh, is, is something that I do. I kind of live, live the recommendations that I give, which is a morning meditation. And easy to do anybody can do it this not does not require special clothes or special special anything um uh of course uh no i, I th so this is what i do when i wake up every morning including this morning i wake up not looking at the phone i go and boil some water and um this meditation was actually taught to me by a monk uh who has a tea institute in Taiwan and I was at this beautiful hotel and um, I got invited to a tea meditation with the tea monk and they said do you want to come I said sure and um, 
he did not say very much, but there were five of us sitting around. It was an outdoor kind of pavilion in a beautiful kind of outdoor space. And we just all sat around together and he brewed the tea for us. He offered us the glasses, uh, the cups, the, these beautiful handmade ceramic bowls. We drank it in silence and I, it was kind of a big bowl of tea. And I thought, ooh, got, got through it. That, that's great. Well, eight bowls of tea later, the meditation was over. But I've never been so calm in this um, in this space of everybody everybody just sitting there enjoying enjoying the um, the sensory reflections of the environment, the tea, the warmth of the tea, the smell of the tea, the feel of the tea uh, going down. I must say. I, I happen to love tea. Everybody says, can I do it with coffee? I do too. And I say, yes, yeah, you, I do you too. can do yeah. it. Um, you can do it with coffee. But the, the thing that helped me, so I did this um, seven years ago. Um, I got to sit with this monk for five days in a row uh, because I was there at the hotel for five days in a row, including a day where I was the only guest that showed up. So I had this private tea meditation. And I can say truthfully that every single day since that day, I have done that tea meditation for myself. It was so calming uh, it, it, um, that I do it on my own. And the thing that allows me to kind of get into it, like I don't need, um, uh, I don't need him to be there uh, waiting for me every morning when I wake up to serve me the tea, but the ritual of the, the boiling, the seeping of the tea, the drinking, and starting over again. So I do, I do, I um, I seep about you know five to seven individual cups of tea as I do this forty-five minute ritual in the morning. No, um, uh, no phones, no TV, no no music, uh, and I just uh, took his recommendation. I do it in front of all of my plants. And so I, I, you know, I'm in Manhattan, so not not a lot of nature, but I do have house plants. And um, the the added benefit that I found is that it turns out if you meditate while looking at your house plants, you notice when they are thirsty and they don't die anymore. So I inadvertently kind of um, turn myself from a plant killer into a plant nurturer because I included the plants in my morning ritual and um it's it doesn't have to be that long doesn't have to be t tea it can be coffee but that moment to it helps me wake up it helps me appreciate the here and the now and um um and i i, I do it every morning the point i hear you talking about is calibrating the affections of our heart and the focus of our of our minds which allows us then to navigate throughout the day with greater strength. Is that what I hear you saying? Exactly. It is. It is. It is a wonderful um, direction, intention, uh, um, setting moment of my day. And it's a moment for myself. Um, it's a moment I find myself kind of naturally. I, I don't sit there and try and get all the thoughts out of my mind. I really try and focus on how I feel and and the and appreciation. What am I mm. appreciative for? And it's a wonderful way, simple way to start to start the day. And um, and it it really it really allows me to uh, then deal with all of the things that come in because I have things that come in like everybody else and in one stress. Uh, on top of the other. But if you started with a moment of reflection, a moment of appreciation, uh, a moment of gratitude for yourself, um, um, it, it really, it, it, it shifts how you're able to, um, it kind of gives this, uh, I, I'm having this image coming to my mind of this kind of transformer where there's this armor, uh, but it's an mm -hmm. armor of meditation. Uh, it's a armor of mindfulness that, that protects me um, because I do this every morning. Now, this is really interesting. I want to stack that up against the fact that, in your words from your book, 90% of the population struggles with anxiety. So, the yeah. question, Dr. Suzuki, is what are we missing then in our approach to understanding and treating it overall? 
So, you know, I, I want to be very careful. There are clinical levels of anxiety that become sure. um, overwhelming, pathological. Um, mm -hmm. My book really addresses um, the, the what I call everyday anxiety. Uh, this is the, the anxiety that, that does suck your energy. It's like, oh, can I, how long can I keep this up with? You're not going to the hospital. You're not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, seeking uh, medical treatment. But um, because of what we talked about earlier, uh, all of these stressors and anxiety triggers that are coming up uh, mm. that are facing us, this is what we, um, we are dealing with. And so it is, um, this is where these tools of neuroscience and psychology and um, uh, the power of mindset can yeah. really help yeah. uh, address uh, these things. And you think, oh, that's just, you know, that just won't help me. Um, but <laughs> if you use them in an, um, uh, in a, in the way that, that science has shown us, shown us that, that, uh, psychology has, has shown us can work. Mm -hmm. They can be so powerful and really change. This is, this is, you know, good anxiety is the uh, name of my book. And, and yeah. it is really a, the jujitsu move of you can actually um, harness the power and the energy underlying your own anxiety um, and use it to help propel you forward instead of keeping you, you know, worried in the, in the same place. That is, that is the, um, that is the superpower. And that is the, the, you know, karate move. I wanted to give all the readers of this book. Well, that's really good. Let's go right there then. Your argument is that anxiety can be good, even helpful. Take us in. I mean, this is counter yes. to what a lot of us hear, but I want to hear more about that. You you push the button, so I yeah. want to go in. Okay, okay. So here are the steps to making anxiety your uh, superpower, taking advantage of, of anxiety. Um, hmm. Step number one is is you you can't get there from that that you know deep fear of of anxiety. You're already in anxiety. That that's not the point. And so my first step that I talk about in the book is learning the tools to turn down the volume of your anxiety. And so mm -hmm. there's many many tools in the book. The top two you've heard before, but they are scientifically proven and and they are um, they work. And they also work immediately, which is why I always start with them. Mm. First yeah, one what are they? is yeah. number one, meditation breath work. So deep breathing. And you think, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. But did you did you realize that that comes from um, not just the scientific world, but even thousands, hundreds of years of meditation practice? So the oldest form of meditation is breath work. Breath meditation is the wow. very oldest because the monks didn't realize, uh, didn't know how our nervous systems work, but they said, hey, when I breathe deeply, I could get myself and all of my students into this, into this calm meditative state. They've known that, we've known that um, for hundreds of years. So why does that work? Well, it's actually working on a part of the nervous system that scientists later on discovered it's called, it's part of the autonomic nervous system that has two equal and opposite parts. We're all familiar with the fight or flight part of that autonomic nervous system. That is that, that stress um, uh, response that happens when you could be in danger, something comes up and you're either, uh, your body is, is um, uh, uh, put into a modality where it could either fight the enemy or run away from the en en enemy. So blood to your muscles, uh, um, heart rate raised, um, um, uh, respiration rate raised. Um, we all know this as familiar in, in uh, cause it of often comes with the emotion of anxiety. But yeah. what people don't realize is that there's an equal and opposite part of the autonomic nervous system, that fight or flight part of the, the uh, equal and opposite to the fight or flight system called the rest and digest part of our nervous system that whose goal is to relax you, to de-stress you. 
And so while everybody says, oh yeah, I know fight or flight, nobody knows that there's, everybody has. It's not just the lucky ones, but we all have this rest and digest system. And um, so what does it do? It naturally decreases our heart rate, decreases our respiration rate, and it shunts blood from our muscles towards our digestion and reproductive organs. And well, I can't, I can't will my blood to be shunted to my digestion and reproductive organs, and I can't will my heart rate to go whatever rate I want. I can consciously change the um, rhythm of my breath. That will help trigger all of the entire uh, power of this rest and digest part of the nervous system oh. for aficionados. That is also called the parasympathetic yeah. nervous system. And so that is why breathwork works. Breath work works. Hmm. Okay. Did we cover both steps? Was that steps one and two or was that just one? No. No, I, I, I was pausing to see whether you had any questions. No, I, I, I do. On In the fact, explanation. Yeah, I do. It's fascinating. Um, because there's a lot of talk these days around vagal system, uh, the vagus nerve, and really it being 12th cranial it's the longest nerve uh in our system it goes all the way down to our abdomen we can do a lot of in fact i've talked to dr james gordon about this vagus nerve stimulation that can help bring us into a yeah. in a into a state of homeostasis etc is there anything we can know or need to know about mm -hmm. uh the vagal system nervous system overall moving from sympathetic to parasympathetic and how we can do that like what specifically in breath work do we need to know that could unlock that is it soft belly breathing is it deep is it you know walk us through that so um it's it's uh, yeah absolutely the vagus nerve is is part of that um it's even simpler so okay the the parasympathetic nervous system gets activated with deep breathing it's hard to be fearful when you are in this deep breath kind of situation that that wow. is just um it's also hard to be calm when you're going <laughs> when, when you're when you auto automatically put your heart rate i'm uh, sorry your respiration rate yeah up high it is a profound um director of how we are we are feeling how we can make ourselves feel mm -hmm. um th th it's not solely due to the 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 twelfth the twelfth nerve, even though okay. stimulation of yeah. that has been shown to calm us. But it's it's simple. You don't even have to know about the twelfth nerve. All you have to do know is that um you know I like to take people in breath work, deep breathing is the yeah. oldest form of meditation, hundreds, even thousands of years old. This is something that we could all do. And so I like to recommend um uh, um and also, I will acknowledge there are thousands of breathwork kinds of techniques. You might be saying, well, which one, which one should I do? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the one that I like to recommend is a simple one, easy to remember. It's uh, called boxed breathing. I'm sure you've heard of it, which is four parts, uh, four, four part breath. It's an inhale on four counts. Everything's four. Okay. You hold it at the top for four counts. You exhale deeply on four counts and you hold it at the bottom for four counts. And there's only a, a billion different, um, you know, variations of that. You do longer outhale, exhale, different breath counts, but this one is easy. It's doable. And the thing is that I like to tell people that you can employ this in the middle of an anxiety provoking conversation. Somebody's talking at you, it's causing you anxiety. It's the person that's always caused anxiety for you know the whole time you've worked there. And to help you get through that conversation, just do this breath work. They won't even know you're doing it. Um, and it can calm you right in, literally in the moment. So, um, wow. and, and then I'll say, if you don't like that one, well, go to YouTube, uh, uh, search short breath work, and then you have a, a plethora of, of um, highly rated or not so highly rated uh, short breath exercises that you could mm. find the one that you really love. But that is simple. It's usable. It's doable. Um, and I love that it, it's, it's so simple. You can teach it to your kids. 
put that in their back pocket as they go to school. Something's happening and you don't like it, well, just take a moment, practice with them. You can practice as a family. Um, do do that counting together and and notice. What, what does that do to you? What does that do to you? Mm. How does that make you feel? Uh, and know that what you're doing is you're activating your natural de-stressing part of your nervous system. That's incredible. Okay, just to recap the steps for box breathing. In for four, hold yeah. for four, mm-hmm. exhale for four. Yeah. Is that it? Yes. Hold at the bottom for four. Hold at no, the bottom. No, there's four steps. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Inhale for four, hold for four at the top. Got it. Exhale for four, hold for four at the bottom. Do we want yeah, to breathe? Do we want to breathe in through our nose? Because I've seen some breath work where people are taking, <gasps> breathing in through their mouth. What's your recommendation? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think uh, I like to do it in in the way that feels natural. Okay. Natural for us. Okay. And I must say, I have a friend who is a breath work specialist, and you can really get into the weeds for what feeling different, you know, mouth versus nose versus strong versus light uh, can can do for you. But this is that all purpose, uh, um, uh, all purpose flower version of, of <laughs> breath meditation, this box breathing for four counts uh, for each corner of the box. Oh, it's so, so good. Uh, I, I like to start with that. Yeah, I'm loving this. Okay, let's so, go to step two then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, actually, before we go to step two, I have to give my other favorite recommendation yes. for turning the volume sure. down for anxiety, which is um, um, kind of the thing that transformed my research in my life, which is the power of moving your body to hmm. change your mood. Okay. So and um, let me start with the science and then I'll tell you what exactly it's going to do for you. The science is that every single time we move our bodies, it... Um, can't, it releases a whole bunch of neurochemicals in our brains. That That is, you said you were so uh, focused on the mind-body connection. There is a beautiful example of the mind-body connection. Moving your body, moving your muscles, all the external part, it is changing the neurochemical environment of your brain. Mm. And the neurochemicals that I want to highlight, there are many, but for our conversation, it's going to be increasing dopamine levels, increasing serotonin levels, increasing noradrenaline levels, increasing endorphin levels. That's what happens when you start moving your muscles, moving moving your body, um, particularly the aerobic kind, any kind of movement that increases your, your heart rate is particularly good at getting those neurochemicals up and the image I like to give is every single time you're moving your body it's like giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath Mm. of neurochemicals that is how I motivate myself to do my workouts every morning it's like ah my brain needs that bubble bath I want it to be nice and shiny and clean before I go into work Um, and so um, then the question is well what is the minimum amount that I of movement that I really have to do to get that bubble bath Wendy and uh, so the answer is there are studies that have shown that 10 minutes of walking 10 minutes of walking you don't even have to change your clothes 10 minutes of walking can um, decrease your anxiety levels decrease your depression levels so that's that is why i like that they're immediate the breath work immediate calms you down moving your body 10 minutes of walking everybody can do it no no extra paraphernalia required decreases your anxiety and depression level because it's changing the neurochemical balance in your brain so that's step one that's the science of step one we we all need to turn that volume down also knowing that we're never going to eliminate our anxiety, right? You, you, we're trying to get it from, I, I just can't, it's just, you know, can't function to, okay, it may be still there or it may come up, but it's not that, that kind of uh, fire engine level anymore. So we've turned that volume down and um, the st- second key step is comes with, that state of realizing, okay, I found my thing. I found my meditation. I found my movement that, oh yeah, I feel like that. I could feel that, that anxiety level go on down when I go out for that walk around the block, when I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit anxious. And the power that comes with that 
is that that um, turning down the volume allows you to step back and understand the warning system, the power and the value of the warning system that anxiety was built for. Instead of looking at it like this is the enemy that I want out of my life, in fact, anxiety is a warning system. Can it help you? And, um, um, you know, there are anxiety. So I want everybody to think about the most historically, the most common anxiety that you've had since you were a kid. Um, we all have that. And for me, even though I'm a speaker now, it's um, a form of social anxiety. I was a really, really shy uh, little girl. And so part of me still thinks, even though I, you know, I go and uh, talk to, I have to go uh, address the incoming class of NYU just next week or no, in two weeks. Um, I'm really excited about that. But part, sometimes uh, when I get into scary social situations, I, I revert back to that, to that anxiety. And, um, you know, what, what is that telling me? And uh, for years and years and years, I, I never asked myself that. It was just like, oh God, here, how come I'm so scared? How come I'm scared at this, you know, cocktail party? And it's it's awkward for me to go up and talk to talk to new people, mm -hmm. which has been, you know, all of my life. Um, and the the lesson that I've learned in writing this book is that, you know, that what's on the other side of that conversation for me is something that I value so much, which is that connection, that friendship that could develop. I personally have never been uh, somebody that has hundreds, thousands of friends. You know, uh, I, I have so many different relationships. I have smaller but deeper friendships that mean so much to me. Mm. And I think part of the um, uh, part of that fear is that uh, I won't have I won't have those those wonderful connections or I won't have enough of them. And so it uh, sometimes it l allows you to laugh at the at the child, not kind of childish. I'm, I'm talking about myself. So yeah, sure. so some of these fears come from childhood and they are childish. And but it, it's so enlightening to say, oh, well, I still that that still comes up and you can say, oh, that that was just the old warning system that's still there. And now it's this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I don't have that same fear that I did. I've developed all these approaches and techniques to do this thing that scared me so much when I was I was young. Um, so so that's just a personal example of that warning system and how it can transform your own understanding of of how to address these fears that come up and they will always come up they'll always be that little little girl that was afraid to you know uh make an introduction of herself to somebody else um and then i'll just have to acknowledge that oh that's the little girl again let me let me revert back to uh adult wendy and and do it a little bit differently uh um and take advantage of all the history that i've i've um i've lived in my mm. life it's really fascinating on how you have learned to leverage anxiety to discern where you were, where you are, where you want to go, and then even just reframe your exactly. mindset, which then propels you into a new direction. Yes. I'd love to know, you know, to that, what right. makes anxiety yeah. so dynamic and changeable then? What makes it so dynamical and changeable? I think it's kind of a function of where mm. anxiety sits in our society right now. Okay. So it's so dynamic. It, it appears so dynamic because on one hand, everybody hates it. Yeah. So it's this like thing that nobody appreciates, nobody wants. But on the other hand, evolutionarily, it is truly protective. It probably helped us survive as a species. Those of us that had that, you know, our ancestors, of course, that had that that uh, sense of warning that kept us away from the lions and the tigers and the bears. That is that is the ultimate use mm. of anxiety. So it is life saving, yeah. and we want to get rid of it all all at the same time. And I think that's huh. where this dynamism that you you just referred to might come yeah. from. Yeah, does it, that make no, sense? It really does. Okay, generic question, but it makes me curious based upon what we've talked about. Do thoughts 
affect emotions yeah. or do emotions affect thoughts? Uh, I think both. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely both. And, and that is a, um, you know, that is an interesting, uh, um, ocean to jump mm -hmm. into, uh, where, you know, where is the chicken? Where is the egg? Um, and feelings also affect both thoughts and emotions. And I think the, the tools that we were talking about before the breath yeah. work, the movement gets you into a particular way of feeling in your body the breath work also affects how you feel mm -hmm. in your body you know the just bringing the breath all the way down into your belly can be very very powerful very cleansing and um that will that will make you um give you a feeling i mean i loved uh, once i got into the uh, kind of workouts i love to this day i love kickboxing class i don't i, I don't like hit anybody it's it's just doing doing the moves right in a typical kickboxing class i love it because it makes me feel so powerful so it's it's the power moves of the punching and the kicking uh and the choreography um uh together with that um uh together with the you know the actual exercise itself so it's like a double a double dose of um uh empowerment that you get from that, that will affect both your emotions. You know, I come out of exercise feeling, feeling powerful, feeling like, uh, uh, you know, um, um, a leader, um, and, uh, um, and, and going into my day with, with those kinds of emotions rather than the fear, the worry, the, the concern, uh, that I didn't answer all the emails that I got yesterday which I did, but that's still okay. <laughs> that's super helpful. Okay, so I wanna stay on thoughts just for a moment. Thoughts aren't simply nebulous. They yeah. can, and you talked about this in the book regarding neuroplasticity, they can change the physical structures of the brain. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the basis of neuroplasticity. Give us a crash course, Dr. Suzuki, on what a thought is, mm -hmm. and then the potential it has to change the physical structures of the brain. So, okay, so here's what we can say from neuroscience. If I could tell you exactly what a thought was, I would have won the Nobel Prize. So I'm not gonna promise that. But what I can tell you is that the neurons and networks, large networks of neurons in our brains and their electrical activity, how exactly they are communicating with each other in their specific phone form of communication, which are brief bursts of electrical activity called action potentials. That is, that is a thought. Okay. So a neuron, networks of neurons and their, how they're firing create our thoughts. Um, and, uh, how do you change? So, so the work that I've done is not so much, how do you change a thought, but how do you change the structure and the function of the brain and the studies that I've done really focus on something that we talked about, um, before, which is the power of physical activity, uh, to do that. And for that, we, we go to a brain structure that is my favorite brain structure in the brain called the hippocampus. We have two hippocampi, one on the right side, one on the left side. This is a key brain structure that allows us to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events. Not all kind of memories. Motor memories are, are, um, are taken care of by another brain system. These are facts that we learned in school, memories for all the events, all the wonderful summer activities you just did, memory for all of that. Every time you think back on the, the watermelon and the beach and the, you know, uh, all the fun times you have, that is because you have a working hippocampus. And um, so I've studied the hippocampus for many, many years. And the reason why I got into exercise is that I noticed after I, um, I had gained 25 pounds when I tried to, uh, and successfully, I, I was successful in get, getting tenure, but I, I ended up with 25 extra pounds on my body, and uh, which sent me directly to the gym. And so I was just trying to lose weight. So I, I uh, 
could feel and and look better. And um, but I couldn't help notice that that as I did that, um, I was successful at that uh, after a year and a half. That my memory and my focus got better. My memory. I was studying memory in my lab. And so now we go back to the neurochemical bubble bath. Every single time I was going to the gym, giving myself that neurochemical bubble bath. Well, it wasn't just um, dopamine and serotonin, which was make me feel so good. My mood improved. I felt so much more powerful as I was going through this journey and getting really regular at going to the gym. But the other thing that increases um, in, the, in your brain with every single workout is a growth factor called BDNF. You don't have to remember this, but BDNF stands for brain derived neurotrophic factor. This helps neurons grow, helps them connect better. And it, what it does is it goes directly into the hippocampus and the hippocampus is one of only two adult human brain areas that can grow brand new brain cells. Think about that for a second. Your brain cannot, there's no new neurons being grown in your brain since you're born, except in two brain areas. And the hippocampus is one of them. And so now I've just told you that exercise increases that growth factor that then makes new brain cells be born in your hippocampus. And so there have been beautiful studies done showing that there is, um, with, with uh, if you go from couch potato rats to regular gym rats, you know, literal gym rats, they go on the exercise wheel every single day, um, their hippocampus will get significantly larger, their memory will be better, and their mood and their kind of emotional resilience will be better as well. So that is the kind of neuroplasticity that I've studied the most. Does it change your thought? No, but it makes your hippocampus bigger and stronger and gives it more capacity to take in and remember all those facts and events that, um, that you're living um, in your life today. I love that you took us into hippocampal activity. I've been studying it myself and obviously you're a professional. I am so, mm. so far down the, the chain in terms of being a novice in this space, but I'm fascinated <laughs> by it, right? So um, yes. we've been talking yeah. about anxiety. We've been talking about um, rewiring our brain. And then all of a sudden you bring in the hippocampus to this. Where does storytelling come into play in this? We, the yes. stories we tell ourselves about our potential, um, how does the hippocampus really function in weaving together our life experiences um, to really narrate for us a mm. story of life whereby we will live either from potential, I can do this, or I'm a victim of life. I may have just done a really bad job of even connecting those, yeah. th those uh, factors, but I'm just curious about the stories we tell ourselves and really the, the hippocampal activity in the brain in compiling these life experiences to help direct our lives. On the contrary, I was about to say, you've just made a really interesting mm. high level kind of connection between the hippocampus and um, stories mm. uh, and the stories that we tell ourselves. Because um, really, and you also hit upon something that's near and dear to me, which is um, my kind of career long um, um, pillar, which is the reason why I study, I studied and I continue to study memory and the hippocampus is because the hippocampus allows us to retain our own life histories. Mm -hmm. You know, who are we without the memories of our lives. Um, I always ask students, you know, would you be the same person if suddenly all your high school memories were, were wiped out? Or wow. would we be the same person if all of our COVID memories, right. were, if nobody could remember um, COVID at all, but you can remember everything else. It was just like those memories. Um, and then you start to realize that all of that woven together, all of our, our life history and what we remember what we recall, uh, you know, we've all had that that experience talking with friends or family members about the event, and somebody says, "Don't you remember that happened?" <laughs> You're like, "I have no idea," but I do remember this other thing that happened, you know, on the sideline or where where I was looking at this event. Um, it is personal, 
And um, you're absolutely right that the hippocampus is critical for allowing us to form those things. And then it gets a little bit more complicated as as uh, you get into kind of the the more uh, psychology of what is the story do that I tell about myself? Do I tell myself again, going to my example, that I am uh, I, at my core that shy little girl uh, that that you know was so scared of of speaking yeah. in front of people and and scared at parties and scared uh, um, of rejection in in trying to make friends, which was absolutely true, or. Do I tell myself that, yeah, I used to be that, but you know, look at me now that, that, uh, I, I've, I've gained skills and I'm so much better at that. And that, that I realized how important that was to me, um, as a life goal. And, and, and now that fear that's still there kind of reminds me, ooh, that's, that's important. I'm, I'm a little bit scared because this is an important, you know, possible connection that I could make. Um, and yes, the hippocampus, um, the hippocampus is critical in that. Um, you actually remind me of, uh, in Good Anxiety, I have a whole bunch of um, um, tools to decrease anxiety. And we talked about the first two, right? Breath yeah. work and, and exercise. But there's a whole third part of the book that um, has lots of tools. And I, uh, your, your wonderful question reminds me of my very favorite science nerdy tool that I invented just for this book that I would love to share here because people might miss it. Okay. And it, it focuses on the hippocampus. And so this tool, uh, it, you heard it here first. This tool is called joy conditioning. Okay. And it is a tool that I, um, that I, uh, verbalized in direct opposition to something that that uh, has been studied for a long time called fear conditioning. Fear conditioning is something we've all experienced. You know, when I lived in Washington, D.C., my apartment was broken into um, um, one Sunday. And I remember coming around the corner and seeing my my front door crowbarred in. And I always had that feeling from then on, whenever I came around that same corner, it was terrible thing to have. I, I had this fear, oh, I, I'm going to see the door, you know, crowbarred in again. That never left until I le until I moved away. I still think about it. That's fear conditioning. It is that warning system. It's a little bit like anxiety. I, I you know, I felt anxiety too, as I fear and anxiety as I turned the corner because I remembered that terrible event. And we carry all these fear conditioning things around with us for a long, long time. It's protection. It, uh, but, but we could all think of ways that we have been fear conditioned for different experiences. And I thought, oh, that's so depressing. How come we can't have like positive conditioning? How, how does that work? And I realized from my almost 30 years of studying the hippocampus that we can have that. And that is the idea behind joy conditioning. Joy conditioning uses how memories are formed in the hippocampus to, um, uh, to uh, fortify the most joyous memories in our lives. And so here's how it works. Everybody go back and think about, let's just start with one of my favorites. Think about a situation that made you laugh so hard you almost peed, <laughs> or maybe you did pee, okay? Yeah. So laughing so hard you peed, right? Everybody's had one of, one of those. And so the idea is very simple. That is every time that that's an event memory. It's dependent on the hippocampus. You encoded that with your hippocampus. And I also know that the way to strengthen that there's only way, one way to strengthen it. Relive that memory. Think about it again. Laugh. So make yourself laugh so hard that you almost pee a second time. And um, by strengthening those memories, I feel like there's this uh, this this weight uh, that I'm visualizing. On one side are fear conditioning memories that are building up, but now you have this capacity uh, to go back and counteract those fear conditioning memories with the joy conditioning memories that you choose. And of course, you can do funny, you can do uh, uh, joyous, you can do family, you can do you know uh, whatever you want. But but it made me realize how little time I spend thinking back on the joyous moments in my life. And so that is one of the tools in, in good anxiety. It's really powerful. There is inherent strength in joy. Yes. 
Absolutely. And when you start to think back, you realize, oh my God, look at all of these memories. How come I have not thought about these and all the experiences, amazing, you know, things that you've seen in your life uh, domestically or internationally or, you know, uh, in your neighborhood. Um, um, all it's it's a, a new way to appreciate your life. So, uh, yes, and joy is very powerful. Let's talk about the power of negativity bias. What's that about? Ah, negativity bias is, um, again, uh, we have evolved so many protective mechanisms that um, that have helped us. Anxiety helped us get away from animals. The fight or flight system also helped save our lives uh, as we ran away from the dangers uh, that existed when we first evolved. Negativity bias is also... Um, um, in that genre. Um, so negativity bias is that we tend to remember the negative more than the positive. Uh, and um, yeah, so, uh, and also I think everybody can relate to if you go into kind of group conference meetings that if you're discussing a candidate or some, you know, something that, that the whole group is trying to agree upon. Have you ever noticed that one negative word can tank the idea and the same positive is like, it, okay, it's kind of incremental. You have to kind of double the positive to have the same impact on really the same level of negative. Why? Because it sticks harder in our mind. That is, that is a potential danger. We need to worry about it. And um, I mean, I'm also so careful about um, how I talk about something in the negative and the positive because I'm aware of these neg negativity biases. Um, and so, so um, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting lens to look at how you see. I mean, I think about uh, the memories that I think of, the memories of, oh, you know, that time I did something so stupid. Uh, first, here's the first stupid thing I remember, the second stupid thing. Those are, those are negativity biases. I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want to do that mistake ever again. So it sticks strongly in my mind and I have to work double hard to get those joy conditioning memories in. Same, mm -hmm. same kind of idea. Okay, let's connect then. When I asked you earlier, do thoughts affect emotions or do emotions affect thoughts? And then connect negativity yeah. bias, joy conditioning. Within that is a bathtub, to use an illustration, a similar illustration of emotions. Yes. So how do we then regulate our emotions? Yeah. So emotional regulation, I think, is something that that um, I, I've, I think very, very deeply about. And you come at it from uh, different perspectives. Uh, I think one of the biggest perspectives to remember, and we've all felt this, is that when we get deep into anxiety, um, all the nuances of emotion kind of leave. It's either everything is bad, like nothing is good right now, and, and maybe it could get better. Um, but the thing that helps me is to remember the real kaleidoscope of emotions that people are, are, um, that are available to them and to be mindful of, of where we are. Yeah, of course, I want to call a, a, a stinky sock a stinky sock. If it's really bad, then yeah, that's, that's really, really bad. But you could also appreciate, um, other other um, other emotions around it, why it's so bad, um, and kind of keep that keep that. Um, um, there's there's in the book there's this wheel of emotion that that is shown, and so you can imagine if there's only two choices, good and bad, then once you choose it, there's no other choice. You know, you, you're in bad. But if you keep it in mind for the whole kaleidoscope of emotions, okay, you're you're in this lower left hand corner, which is which is the negative space. But look at all the different spaces you have to get into to get your get out of that negativity. It's it's not all or none. There is this um, uh, range of emotions, and and I wanted to start there because people don't. Yes appreciate that and just just understanding even though they know it if if they just think a little bit about 
the range of emotions that they, they are able to feel. But it's so easy to go into, okay, it's just bad. I have no other way out. It's just bad and it's never going to be anything anything ever different mm -hmm. from that. that. That is so untrue. And this is a, a mindset shift kind of trick um, that, um, that I think is, is very, uh, very powerful. But, but because I have a um, four o'clock cutoff time, sure. I would love to um, get to the third step of getting to please. good anxiety. Yes, we, we talked about turning the volume down and then we're now talking about um, re emotions, regulating your emotions, being more aware of your emotions when you've turned the volume down. So all of this conversation is very, very relevant. But I want to make sure that we get to uh, what I think the secret sauce of my book is, which is what is the gift that comes from uh, anxiety again? I'm not sure I understand that. I bet there's lots of uh, <laughs> listeners out there yeah, say like, yeah. what, what is your gift exactly? So let me be really, really specific. I talk about six different gifts or superpowers that come from anxiety, and we don't have time to go through all of them. And mm -hmm. I also want you to take the time to read the book to, to kind of get into them. Um, but I, I do want to share two of my favorites. The first one I share because it's easy to get into. You are all going to be able to use this gift today. Okay. And that is the gift of productivity that comes from your anxiety. And this is one, I love this one because I use this a lot. I have this a lot. It starts with a very common form of anxiety, which is the what if list. What if I didn't reply fast enough to that email or I wasn't polite enough or I didn't say the right thing. And all of these what ifs, um, uh, come at me right before I'm going to go to sleep. So not only are they anxiety, yeah. but they keep me from sleeping yeah. and it's, it's awful, right? This is this, but it, it hits at all times of the day. It's very, very common. So here is the productivity jujitsu move that you do on that. What if list? And, uh, it's very simple, simply turn every what if into a to do. And the way that I use it is look, I'm not going to go and do that. In the in, at night, but ne first thing next morning, all of those things that were worrying me, okay, great. I'm going to go fix them. I'm going to go ask a question. I'm going to take an action on them. Why does that help? It helps because our anxiety was evolved to have an action put onto it. You run away or you fight the lion. That is an action. And so if you put an action onto this anxiety, that helps alleviate, naturally alleviate the anxiety. And you might say, oh, well, well I'm worried about, uh, um, about global warming. How, I can't do anything. And my answer is, of course you can. There are things that you could change in your house right now that will make you more green than you were yesterday. Uh, and not all of them cost money. Um, lots of things that you can do that are in your power to do to put a positive action on each of these worries and the amazing superpower like, um, 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 uh, result is that you become more productive as a person in your work. Um, uh, I want to give, uh, my lawyer the, uh, uh, credit she deserves, uh, when she found out that I was writing a book on anxiety. She said, Oh, well, I'm a high paid lawyer right now because of my anxiety. And she told me this superpower. And I, then I wrote about it in the book, but I give her credit every single time. <laughs> I just want to end. So that's one superpower. Yeah. I, I yeah, want to it. fulfill my promise yeah. to give the second, uh, final superpower. And that is a superpower of empathy. You have a superpower of empathy that comes with your own anxiety. I'm going to use my own um, example of my oldest anxiety, fear, social fear. And so social fear, uh, growing up, uh, very, very shy, uh, very um, anxious to ask questions in class, even though I was very engaged, you know, I became a professor, uh, but still always had fear of doing that. But I realized the first day I stepped in front of the classroom when I was a graduate student to teach that that was a gift in disguise because I knew there were so many students out there in the audience, just like me, that they were so engaged, but they were afraid to ask uh, in front of the class. And so I've always come early, stayed late to um, 
answer those questions to um, it's really an act of compassion really I, I have empathy for those students that have the same form of anxiety as I did I recognize them I could tell you want to ask the question but you're not doing it right now so I give you an opportunity I make sure you have an opportunity to do that in a less kind of anxiety provoking situation and the, how that becomes a superpower for everybody is that you all have your own specific form of anxiety that you're really, really familiar with. You know how it feels, you know how it looks, and you can recognize it. So your superpower is turn that to the outside, go to the general public, go through your life. And when you see somebody with that same form of anxiety, all you have to do is give a kind word and help them through that, that moment. And I love this one because um, I can't think of anything that we need more in this world today than higher levels of empathy. Dr. Suzuki, thank you so much for being here today. Any last words? Um, I guess my last thoughts would be that, you know, we've gone through this kind of three-step process to really transform your bad anxiety into good anxiety. And my hope for all of your listeners is that if you learn to lean into that anxiety, including the negative, you know, the bad feeling that comes with it, um, you will be able to find those superpowers. And that will lead to a more fulfilling, a less stressful, and um, uh, a more empathetic life. That's so and good. that's what I wish for all of um, your listeners. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Suzuki. I really appreciate it. You are so welcome. Great conversation. Thank I really you. enjoyed it.